in growing up in Christ. Next to the doctrine of the sacred atonement, which is based on the doctrine of the fall, and the divine sonship of Christ, next to these things, the doctrine of the rebirth or the new birth is the most important doctrine to be taught among the Latter-day Saints. It goes back in its origins to the very beginning, to the original revelations of the Lord to Adam, where well, here, for example, in Moses chapter 6, verse 58, he says, Therefore I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely to your children. And then he gives the classic statement in all scripture on the doctrine of rebirth. And it's a sad, sad thing, my brothers and sisters, that as the Latter-day Saints, we haven't picked up on this. I don't think I have ever, in my gospel experience, heard a true, detailed, and full discussion of the doctrine of rebirth. I've heard vague allusions to it. I've heard various swings at it, if I can put it that way. But this ought to be the doctrine that we begin to teach in kindergarten, in primary, and that every elder and high priest ought to master and know thoroughly in its detail. And if we don't do it, then we're merely living in the externals of the gospel, merely teaching the administrative program, and really dealing with outward principles and ideas. This doctrine of the new birth leads into Zion. It's uh, the inner road, if you can put it that way, the inner road to Zion. And it leads to a renewal of the people of God that uh, finally brings them through to the baptism of fire and the endowment of glory. So it's very vital and very important. I won't be able to discuss, and I don't know that it's appropriate for me to discuss, some of the higher echelons of this doctrine, but I would very much like today to discuss some of the basics and the details and get as far as we can on it. To begin with, let me, while the classic statement on this is in the probate price, let me turn to the Book of Mormon, uh, the Mosiah chapter 27. Mosiah 27 deals with the conversion of that renegade kid called Alma the Younger, who was deeply steeped in Hippieville, and who was arrogantly going contrary to the ways of the Lord, until the Lord backed the hearse up to him and let him smell the roses. <clears throat> That's not your cue now to take off of that funeral. <laughs> and see what eternity was all about. And in the course of that dramatic conversion, and there's far more to the, the conversion of Alma than we think, there is much more to it than we think. Uh, this is one of the great examples of rebirth in not only its basic but in its higher echelons. And we need to dwell on that in our thinking far more than we do. But in the course of this great transformation, the Lord apparently spoke to Alma, and uh, Alma stands up, I have been repented of my sins, I have uh, been born of the Spirit. And then he adds this report, he says, And the Lord said unto me, Marvel not that all mankind, yea, men and women, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples, must be born again, yea, born of God. 
changed from their carnal and fallen state. And that word state, as we indicated the other day, means a, a condition, an order of things, an order of life. Changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness. And that's not merely getting a testimony. And that's not merely getting into the cultural program and learning of the theology of the gospel. That is a transformation of soul, which in its upper echelons reaches into the full cleansing to where, as in the case of Enos, the Lord said, you are whole. I've made you whole. There's that transformation to that extent. I've seen, if I've seen, for example, old men, when they get aged, a little forgetful of social standards, a little disconcerned in social mores and how they ought to act, they then begin to act on the basis of some of the true elements within their system. They become ugly. They become abusive. And the reason for that is that they really haven't been made whole. And that transformation hasn't extended to the extent that it ought to. The Lord goes on and says, Thus they become new creatures. They're not new in the sense that they know a few ideas and have a mastery of some theological principles. They become new creatures. And unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that's the issue. And how inclusive is it? All mankind, men and women, all nations, there must be a transformation. And that transformation may begin with testimony, and it should begin with testimony. But it reaches into the very depths of the human soul and changes and transforms. And not only changes and transforms, but it renews and makes new creatures. Secular concepts may teach us that through the cultivation of the mind and through proper mental discipline, you can finally come out and blossom out in your true personality and your true being and your true, and your, and your true potential. And educational processes can do that. But that's one thing. That's another thing to ask the question, what can Christ do? He's not interested merely in making you what you have potential to be. He's interested in making you a new creature in him, changing and giving you a new life that's distinctly different. And that's the doctrine of the new birth, see? That's the idea. For example, over here in Alma chapter 5, as uh, the Book of Mormon gives us this, this doctrine, as President Benson said in his prophetic uh, administration to us as a church, there's no, there's no place in the Scripture that teaches this doctrine of renewal better than does the, the Book of Mormon. In Alma 5, for example, you have Alma the Younger talking about the great experience of his father, Alma Sr., at the waters of Mormon and what he did through the powers of the Spirit. And note, uh, let's go back to some of the early verses. Uh, verse 7, Behold, he that is God through the ministry of Alma the elder changed their hearts. Yea, he awakened them out of a deep sleep. They awoke unto God. Their souls were illuminated by the light of the everlasting word, breathing on down through the chains of hell which encircled them about were loosed. He says, their souls did expand and they did sing redeeming love, and I say unto you, they are saved. And then he brings the issue down to the second generation of people with this challenge. Now behold, I ask you, my brethren, to the church, and he's not talking to non-members. He's talking to the membership of the church. Have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received his image in your countenance? Now, his image is the divine nature. The image is the glory and the power. 
the attributes, the gifts, the love, that pure love, which is the love of Christ, and circle the word of. You don't have it until he gives it to you. It's the emotion that centers in his being and his soul, and we only have it when he gives it to us. That's why Mormon says, pray unto God with all the energy of your heart. Ninety-nine and nine tenths percent it is enough with all the energy of your heart that he may fill you. It's an endowment, it's an anointing that he may fill you with this love, which he bestows upon all those who are true sons and daughters of God, by which they will be like him, and without which they will not be like him, regardless of the gifts of the Spirit they have, and regardless of the intellectual achievements, and regardless of the administrative positions they've held in his kingdom. If they're not like him on the basis of that pure love, they're nothing. Now that's the image. Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change? Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body? View this mortal body raised to immortality, to this corruption, raised to incorruption to stand before God to be judged. And then, above all, look forward to that time when he will say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's the issue. And that's the issue. And as Alma discusses that, he says, And now, behold, I say unto you, my brethren, verse 26, if you have experienced a change of heart, and if you have felt the same, the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? Are you still that way? Are you still that way? In verse 49, he then makes this statement. We're dealing now with not just a principle. We're dealing with the very basis, the root, the core, based on the Holy Atonement, the very root and core of the Holy Order. He says, Now I say unto you that this is the order after which I was called, yea, to preach unto my beloved brethren, yea, and to everyone that dwelleth in the land, and to preach unto all, both old and young, both bond and free. I say unto you, the aged and also the middle aged and the rising generation, yea, to cry unto them that they must repent and be born of God. I've had an interesting experience in my own life. For some reason, I had a natural interest and curiosity in studying Mormon literature. Folks used to give me uh, books for Christmas and birthday. One that I treasure is this great big thick book, The Masterful Discourses of Orson Pratt. But earlier than that, Dad had a pretty good library, and I cut my teeth on the autobiography of Part of the Craft. If your kids haven't read that, get yourself a copy. It's a fascinating book. The Life of Joseph F. Smith, uh, another one. And then I fell in love with the key to theology. And I used to take it out on the ditch bank there as I was here getting those naughty Idaho spuds and the little green devils we called sugar beets. <clears throat> Let the water run wild while I practically memorized the key to theology. I had that kind of experience in my early youth, teenage, leading up into my older years. I've been sugar beets for 13 years in my life, beginning at seven years of age. And uh, the farm we had. It was just a total bed of rocks, but it did produce good sugar beets. And we used to sing over the rocks of our salvation. <laughs> and that was before segmented seed came in. And I never thought I'd ever get off the farm. In fact, I converted my wife, Helen May, to get married on the basis that we would go out to Salmon, Idaho, and become cattle ranchers. <laughs> And uh, then I had some transforming experiences. I went into the Army, World War II days, and uh, celebrated 
my 21st birthday by beginning basic training at Camp Fannin in Fort in, in Texas. And as we then came back and shipped overseas, I took about a half a barracks bag full of books with me. And uh, I thought I had a testimony. I had served as a war clerk for a couple of years, beginning about eight, 18, and without being released. When I got 19, as the president of the elders' quorum, one of the first things we did was buy a 20-acre farm. We had a whole bunch of brethren in that farming community who were just good people, but they never saw the light of the church. So I bought this farm, and it was a rugged piece of ground, <clears throat> basically worthless. Soil was good, but you could get water on it unless you just herded the ground with every little stream. But these fellows, being farmers, had their tractors and had their scrapers and had their plows. And so we set apart uh, a couple of Saturdays. And we had so many outfits out there that we had to have stoplights here and there to direct the traffic. And when we got through, we had 20 acres of farm that was table level. And we made a elders project out of it, and that, that project still continues in, in that little area. They sent missionaries out of missionaries. Well, that was a good experience. See. That, was a, that was a good experience. And uh, I got into the farming business myself and bought a 25-acre farm with a home. And, and uh, then Uncle Sam called, and so I rented my farm to someone else, and he got deferred to run it. And I went into the military. But I took that half of bags of books with me, I mean that half a duffel bag full of books with me, got on an old Liberty ship. Uh, down in San Francisco Bay and headed out for the Philippines. And uh, we were crammed in those things with, with uh, beds that were nine tall, that much room, six foot. I had all that junk plus a guitar that I took with me, <laughs> full field pack, steel helmets, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. I chucked on there, and it was right next to the boiler room. <clears throat> and it was so hot that you just beads of sweat on you, so I just made the practice for the 27 days that we were on, on that liberty ship of uh, taking some books and, and an old blanket and going out under one of the lifeboats and spending my time reading while I was watching the flying fish go by. Wondering whether there are any submarines in the area, the porpoises. And as I read, this time away from home, this time a little more serious than just for curiosity, this time with uh, a deeper desire to know what things are really about. As I spent my time on there, and that I landed in the Philippines, I was a new man. It seemed like what I read stood out in bold neon lamp and neon colors. I'd had my patriarchal blessing and patriarch gave me some very special gifts. And those things began to be operative in my life. And I was a new creature. I was changed. I was transformed. I had an integrity in my soul that I didn't have before. And I had my head screwed on straight, not merely in theological ways, but in inner spiritual ways. We had our challenges there. There was corruption and distortion. We used to have to stand guard at the prostitute house keep the fellas from going in and the gals would come out and entice us and all that kind of thing. Went over to Shanghai, China, had 150 prostitutes in the city and demonstrations publicly. Couldn't walk down the street without being propositioned. I was the only one that came back from that experience without some kind of a venereal disease. 
And finally, as I came back then to Korea, where I was in occupation force, in fact, I carried the colors when the American forces were welcomed into Korea on an occupation basis. I was selected to, for that privilege. I came back there having been a field sergeant and having had that hard role to play where you had men who had bloodlust that just as soon slit your throat as they would look at you. And if you didn't stand firm and you weren't solid and you didn't have something, there was no respect there. When I came back, I was finally fully nauseated, and I just simply told the Lord, look, get me out of here. The war had ended by then, and my schedule was to be there for another six months or so, according to the points I had. And I made a covenant with him. I said, sir, you'll get me out of here. I will do in my life what you want to do. And the next week, orders came down, and I shipped out. And I didn't ship out on an old Liberty ship. I was standing by on the U.S. Freeman as they were passing out staterooms. I had been promoted up to the ranks to tech sergeant. Should have been master sergeant, but they froze the, the rankings on us. But as I was standing by there, and they were passing out staterooms to all the officers, they finally ran out of officers. They says... Uh, Anyone else here who could qualify? I said, hey, I'm tech sergeant, sir. Come on over here. So I came home in the stateroom. When I got home, I got out of the Army one day on a Saturday. The next day was a state conference, and I was interviewed for a mission. Now, meantime, I had spent my time studying the gospel. I had read the scriptures through. I had digested all those books. And I went into the mission field. Had a beautiful experience there. And uh, was selected to write the missionary cross-lighting plan for the mission. Which I did. And worked with the mission presidency in the It's before the church had a plan. Finally came back to Rick's and casually walked into the president's office and said... Uh, I knew him well. He was our state president, and Dad was on the high council. And so I went in to say hello to him, and in the course of conversation, not knowing what to talk with him about, kind of like little Timmy coming to my house in the morning the other day, <laughs> I says, well, what are you doing about teaching missionary training here at Rick's? Now, I was a freshman at that time. I had that many hours to be a freshman, and uh, with the hours it gave me for the military and the mission, it would get me just over the line into the sophomore year. And I said, what are you doing for missionary training? He says, well, we used to have a course, but we don't have any, we, we're not offering you this, this semester, or this quarter. And I says, why not? He says, well, we don't have anyone to teach it. I says, oh, yes, you do. He says, who? And I says, me. And I told him that I just got through writing the proselyting plan for the East Central States mission, and I think I could teach his missionaries. And he says, hey, you're hired. <laughs> so I started teaching, and instead of becoming a cattle rancher, the Lord said, keep my sheep. <laughs> and it's been a beautiful experience. But to get back to this issue, the whole thing centers, I've learned by experience, not merely I'm putting the jigsaw puzzle together and finding out what the gospel says about all details and aspects of life. That's important, but it's not important as an ultimate and final goal. It's important as a means to the end. The thing that's important is have you spiritually been born of God? And have you in that order of rebirth reached up into the higher echelons that finally penetrate the veil and that finally bring the endowments of the spirit and the flow? of the Spirit in your life. Is it truly living water? Have you partaken of the living bread, as Jesus called it, see? Now that's the issue, see, and that's that's the thing that we need to teach. And uh, I want to, to discuss that a little with you here in relation to uh, the contribution of the Pearl of Great Price. Now, in the Pearl of Great Price, we need to note that there is a difference between the sons of God and the sons of men. Let me put it this way. 
in the plan of life and salvation, beginning with spirit birth, way back there in the pre-earth past, and extending on up through into mortality and on up through into the celestial kingdom, taking that big span of time and of experience and of organization and of program. In that period, then, there are three basic, and I use the word basic because there are others, but three basic stages of life. There's what you call spirit life. Spirit life is the life that we had a hundred years ago. It's what you could do with the spirit body, what you could experience. And there's a lot more to that first estate than most of us think. We kind of have a celluloid view of it. And there's just a lot more to that first estate. It was a full-bloom first estate program, more so than we ever dreamed. But there's spirit life. And then that wasn't enough. You had to be added upon, as the book of Abraham says. You had to receive the physical endowments. And you had to meet the challenge then of opposition in order to bring forth righteousness and to raise that, that physical body to a plane uh, where it's equivalent then to the spirit and there can be a fusion of spirit and body in the, in the celestial resurrection so that the whole becomes spiritual and immortal and be endowed with the fullness of God's glory. And so there's a challenge there to receive the physical. But in the physical then there's a family relationship. I happen to be born into the Andrews family. One good sister says, Brother Anders, you look like your mother and you act like your dad. And I suspect that that's true, and you need to know them in order to know more fully uh, how interestingly and even cynical that statement is. <laughs> but uh, uh, you have the family relationship, you have the family name, you inherit the traits and the characteristics physically and the idiosyncrasies too, and the oddities, and don't kid yourself, they're there. You have all of those, see, and uh, you have the privileges. You don't have to worry about the doorbell if you got one, and you don't have to worry about asking permission for the refrigerator unless your dad's and mother says no. You see, we've got those privileges, and you can get your hand out for the allowance and all of that, see. Now, that's physical life, and then you grow up and get your pockets to where they're stationary and go commit matrimony and, and uh, enter from the sonship relationship to the father and mothership relationship, and that's the story of the bugs and the bees. Now there's a third stage of life that is absolutely, absolutely necessary to know about and to teach and to enter into and be a participant in and to grow up and mature in, and that is the new birth. And in that new birth, then, you enter into a newness of life. It modifies it modifies the physical and the intellectual. It modifies the idiosyncrasies. It, it modifies the whole character and the whole nature. And it brings you to the standard of Jesus Christ and his attributes and his powers so that you grow up in him and you are his son and his daughter by reason of partaking of attributes and powers, not just in the sense that you have a testimony that he's out there and so you actually go through a transformation, and you become a new creature. And unless you do this, you can kiss the celestial king of goodbye because you will never see it. It's that important. Now, that program, then, is a new birth. It's a third birth, spirit birth, physical birth, and rebirth. And these are the basic ones. And then there are family orders in relation to priesthood. There's family orders in relation to temple ceremonies. And there's family relationships in relation to resurrection. And there's family relationships in relation to eternal life and the fullness. And the final great one is that that pertains to inheritance and eternal dominion. Now, there's a whole bunch of them. But the basic one, then, are these three. And uh, those, then, who, in the Pearl of Great Price, make the transition by their faith into this third stage of life are called sons and daughters of God. The others are called the sons and daughters of men. And that's consistent because that's all they are. They may be gay blades. They may be good teachers of the secular stuff. They may be great romancers. They may be PhDs, they may be lawyers, but they're still sons of men, unless they enter into that new order, see. 
Now, in Moses chapter 6, as we've indicated the other day, the beginning, there was a genealogy kept of the children of God. Now, that genealogy runs of this select group, this third, this third group. And then over here in Moses chapter 8, you have this statement, for example, beginning now with verse 13. And there's a sad story related to this, and let me just bring that out. Uh, verse 13, And Noah and his sons hearkened unto the Lord, and gave heed. And they were called the sons of God. Okay? They were called the sons of God. Now, this is a father and son relationship. A father and son relationship is based on partaking of attributes of a being by which you become his son. It's not just a, an arbitrary one, or an automatic one, or an outward or an external one. It's a life one. It's a relationship of life. It's partaking of the, li the very life of Christ. It's his divine image. And when you partake of his divine image, his life, his gifts, his righteousness, his power, and that's a transforming power, and his love, then you become one of his sons, one of his daughters. You see that? And so you're called sons of God and sons of daughter and sons of, and daughters of God. Now, Noah then and his sons were called the sons of God. And when these men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, now these were daughters uh, uh, of uh, Noah's three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of men saw that those daughters were fair. And that's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. Every true sister in the church ought to be beautiful. And if she lives by the Spirit, she'll be more beautiful than she otherwise would be. And that will blossom out, believe me, in fruition in the celestial kingdom. The most beautiful women in the celestial kingdom are those who are transformed spiritually in their physical nature as well as their character to partake of the attributes of that great person we call the Son of Man of Holiness. And that's the standard of perfection. He's not that anemic person that you portray in many of the paintings. He's a man among men. He's tall. Like that. He's handsome. And he is in every way the perfection of manhood. And this transformation to become his sons and daughters bring you to the point where you partake of his attributes spiritually and physically. And if you sisters want to be beautiful, you want to have the physical features transformed and changed and molded to the standard of the perfect being. This is the way it's done. Those men, then, who become sons of God and who stand in the resurrection and grow up and are modified. See, there's a, there's a, a new birth. The resurrection is a new birth. In this life, the physical traits, the genetical traits, all the bloodlines into which you're born, a lot of time predominate. But that's not true in the resurrection. Those then are overlaid and superseded by the divine and the physical characters and traits of Christ. And there's a modification. There's a basic thing that's still there, but there's a blossoming out of all of those traits and qualities and characteristics to the standard of Jesus Christ. And a man who is a man of God is handsome, is virile, is masculine, and is a whole man in the sense of the love and the charity of God. Now that's what we're looking for, you see. All right, Noah's sons then had daughters and they were fair. And that's the way it ought to be. And they saw those daughters that were fair, and they took them wives even as they chose. Now what happened? These children of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, the grandchildren of Noah, married outside of the gospel program. They were fair. 
They were beautiful. They were appealing. And uh, the gay blades of the day, who hadn't been regenerated, appealed to them, sneaked up on the blind side, and married them. Horrible. Well, the record goes on and says, And the Lord said unto Noah, The daughters of thy sons have sold themselves. For behold, mine anger is kindled against the sons of men, for they will not hearken unto my voice. And it came to pass that Noah prophesied and taught the things of God even as it was in the beginning. How can you picture then Noah finally building the ark in a corrupt age? He got mobbed out four times, according to the prophet Joseph Smith, before he finally got it built. And then as he entered into the ark, having got all the animals and the other forms of life then inside, he steps out and he looks the situation over. His three sons and their wives are there, but his granddaughters aren't. His granddaughters aren't. And he knows what's going to take place and what the Lord has commanded him to do. He raises his hand to the square and says, In the authority of the Holy Priest, to let her rip. He went back in. And it wasn't just the powder of gentle rain and violin music. It was an upheaval. We learned some insights on that from the Book of Mormon. When the Jaredites built their eight barges, they built them so they could be submerged, didn't they? And they were patterned after the ark of Noah. Now, the flood was a cataclysmic upheaval of the greatest magnitude. The fountains of the earth were burst. Prior to that time, the atmosphere considered, the situation was considerably different. It really hadn't rained. It didn't rain. It did it with mist. There was a firmament of water above and beyond. And all of that then burst and cut loose. And the rock rolled. I mean, the ark rolled and, and the mountains shifted and moved. And in the midst of all that, there's Noah thinking about his grandchildren and their kids. And that's the trauma he was underseeing. They were sons of men who married his granddaughters. Now that's the picture of things, see, my brothers and sisters. That's, that, that's the picture. Now, Jesus gave us the, the classic statement, or a classic statement, when Nicodemus came to him by night. We read this, as you all know, in, in uh, John chapter 3. Nicodemus, remember the Sanhedrin? Uh, one of those individuals who fought the battle, and I don't know how well he did it, between uh, social status and testimony of the gospel. On this occasion, at least, he wanted to talk with Christ. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it openly and publicly. Uh, and so he sneaked around and he did it by night. And uh, when he met the Savior, he had several accolades that he made. Master, Rabbi, you're a teacher sent from God. No one can do what you're doing without being such. And apparently, Jesus didn't want to follow that trend of thought very much. He wasn't interested in having his ego built. He wasn't that kind of a person. So he immediately countered it. He said, Verily, verily. Now, in the old uh, Hermetic language, verily meant absolutely, very definitely. And a double verily means what? Well, if there's such a thing as a double, absolutely, you see. And so he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, he didn't say anything about baptism there. He didn't say anything about ordinances there. That is, external ordinances. He's talking about the ordinance of sacrifice, the broken heart and the contrite spirit, which is an ordinance. And that's part and parcel of rebirth. But he didn't say anything about external ordinances. He says, except a man be born again, and some Bibles have a little 
designation, you go read the, uh, what's in the margin, and in the margin it says, born from above. Born from above. If such a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, seeing is to get your eyes open. Seeing is to perceive. Seeing is to discern. Seeing, then, is to view. And you see it from the outside, and you're still outside. You're not in it. You're not in the program. You just see it. It's over there, and, but you can see it. And if you're not born from above, I don't care if you live next door to the temple. You can't see it. The temple is just a building, and those Mormons go in and you don't know what they're doing. And it's only when you get born from above to see that you begin to, to get your eyes opened and your head screwed on straight and see things in the correct way. See, the natural man knows nothing about, about the things of God. The gospel is taught on a spiritual plane. It's revelatory. It isn't intellectual. I got full college degrees. I had a little experience in the intellectual realm of things. It's not intellectual. You learn the good methods of, of, of objective thinking. You can do that. And that's, that's a great thing to do, is to learn how to think clearly and objectively. But uh, the gospel is taught revelatorily. The gospel is taught by the Spirit. The gospel is the living word. And uh, as you get into the upper echelons of it, you have to be taught in other than just the promptings of the Spirit. You have to be instructed with whole sentences and whole words. And you have to come to a knowledge of things, and that's possible, and that's a reality. The Word of God is a reality in that extent, and you can be taught. But you've got to pay the price, and that price is one of faith. And that price is one of an honest heart. That price is one of discipline, where you pray till you sweat. And that price is one of surrender of will. That price is one of consecration. That price, then, is one of standing straight in the midst of contradiction. And all hell breaks loose, and it even seems that the prophet himself is contrary to you. And subordinating your life to him and to the Lord. It's that kind of thing, see? It's the kind of thing that Abraham went through. The Lord had given him all those promises about a posterity and taking him through that whole scenario about getting a son. And here's, and Sarah's 90 so odd and when, she, when he's born. And then the Lord says, okay, Abraham, put him on the altar. And Abraham himself had been strapped to the old iron bedstead and had experienced how gruesome and how crude and how offensive is the idea of human sacrifice. He had been right there. And then the Lord told him after all those things in relation to his son, okay, put him on the altar, do it for him. And it seemed to Abraham that his greatest enemy was the Lord. I once had a state president that, he had been a state president, and he was talking about the gospel, and he was in our high priest class, and he made the comment that, uh, that the Lord never really uh, brought opposition to you in trial, that it just all came about by natural circumstances, and the Lord didn't use them. Well, I listened, and then after the meeting was over, as we were walking down the hall, I walked beside him and put my arm around him and said, uh, mind if I ask you a question? Yeah, no, yeah, go ahead, citizen. In your opinion, who tried and who brought, actually brought the greatest tribulation to Abraham, God or the devil? And he thought, he says, you know, I've been teaching false doctrine, haven't I? <laughs> I've been teaching false doctrine. Well, you're born to see the kingdom. You're not in it. You're born from above. The great statement in the Book of Mormon on, on being born to see the kingdom is Alma 32, planting the seed. And then when it's planted, and there's a life, see, the word is not just a letter. I do not have the word of God here in my hands. I got the standard words here. I got a bunch of printed things and a lot of notes on the side and a lot of red marks underneath. And so I paid a lot of attention to this stuff. 
But I don't have the word of God here. You read Second Corinthians chapter 3. The word of God is that which is written on your heart, the tabernacle of your heart, by the Holy Spirit. See? This stuff is merely letters, and as you read it, you can read it intellectually and master some of it. But it's only when the neon lamps turn on and it stands out on the page and you see things that you've never seen because there's a revelatory power there that says, hey, look, this is what it means. Then it becomes the word of God. You see that? Otherwise, it's just a printed letter. And as Paul said, the letter killeth. The letter is not only demeaning, it kills. And the spirit giveth life, see? Now, the greatest, uh, the greatest statement in the Book of Mormon on, on rebirth is in Alma 32, planting the seed, because the, the seed is the word, and the word has more life in it, actually, than a seed has. And all of you know what can do when you put a seed in the ground and put a fish with it like the old pilgrims did and give it a little water and sunshine, you know. Uh, it begins to, to open up. It, begin, it begins to sprout. Now, that sprouting process takes place inside. It's an illumination of the mind. And so Alma would say, oh, is this not real? Yea, it's real because it's discernible. It's light. And it's the most real experience that you can have. I used to take vocal lessons when I was a kid and do a little with music, so I got so busy that I wasn't able to do too much with it any longer. I made the choice of doing other things. But we had to memorize a song that was committed to music. It was called To Music. And one of the verses went this way. I've sounded all the forms of human pleasure, but thou art greater than all else to me. Now, uh, I'm heading toward the Octagarian stage in life. Not too many more years to go. And I've sounded all the forms of human pleasure. But the greatest experience that I know of, that I have ever experienced, has nothing to do with the physical, primarily, or the intellectual. It's that transformation that takes place. It's that new creature. And this is greater than all else in life. This is not something vague. And we need to teach it freely and understand it. All right, then, having said this to uh, Nicodemus, then Nicodemus has some queries. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus went on and explained the further process as a means of giving him answer. He says, for example, in verse 5, Verily, verily, and there's the old double verily, if anything that's certain, this one is certain then, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, the first statement that Nicodemus received from Christ dealt with seeing. And the second statement dealt with entering. The first statement then is pining the seed and being illuminated by the light of the everlasting word and getting a life power within your system to where you see things that the natural person cannot see. And that's the basic challenge that every missionary ought to make. And that's the basic work that every missionary ought to perform. A missionary is a midwife in the things of the Spirit. A missionary's primary responsibility is not to baptize. A missionary's primary responsibility is to get people born again to see the kingdom so that they can intelligently, with an inner strength and power and illumination of mind and heart and soul, make the decision to overcome the influence of family and friends and priests and ministers and walk forward into the second phase of this rebirth program and be born of water and of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. 
In the great discourse which the prophet gave, I wish we had the full one. He begins with faith and ends up with the, with the uh, blessings of the second comforter, the calling election made sure. But uh, in the opening statement, he says this. But this is at least the report. It's a digested report of what he said. Faith comes by hearing the word of God through the testimony of the servants of God. Page 148. That testimony is always attended by the spirit of revelation and power. Now, if gospel is not attended, gospel teaching is not attended by the spirit of revelation and power, it's merely intellectual fantasy. When you teach, if you don't teach by the power of the spirit, you don't teach. And as Nephi says, when a man speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, and this is Second Nephi 33 and 1, he says, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto, not into, unto the hearts of the children of men. Now, the Spirit doesn't bolt the door and charge through and break it down and go into the person's heart and soul. The Spirit carries it unto his heart, puts it on the doorstep. And the great picture that, uh, of Christ standing at the door and knocking doesn't have a doorknob on the side on which he's standing. The door has to be opened from within, see. So the Holy Ghost carries it unto the hearts of the children of men. But when a man speaks then and teaches the gospel, and it isn't so important how much he knows, the importance of that is that he is humble and the power of the Holy Ghost was with him. My father went on a mission over in Holland as a co-headed Idaho kid from around Idaho Falls and uh, without too much education, he'd been to the Ricks Academy there at Rexburg a little, called to go over there and learn a foreign tongue and to fill a foreign mission uh, back in about World War I days, that period of time. And uh, in the humility of his heart, he sought the Lord. The Lord gave him one of the expressions of the gifts of tongues. He gave him the knowledge of the language through the Spirit. I've been with him when I was a kid, and we used to go down to Salt Lake Conference times, and, and uh, we'd go over and get to the Dutch people. And I've heard those people say, Elder Anders, you speak Dutch just as though you were a native born. But as he was struggling in this program, there was one good family, uh, the Nighters. They were the last name. They moved to Salt Lake. And when we were visiting one time, Sister Benighter uh, told me the story. He said, your dad came over here and he, he didn't know the language. <laughs> he was wrestling with it. We could see that he was wrestling with it. But he was humble. And he was so humble, and you have to know the characteristic of that. When he walks, he walks this way. He just, he just got a driving energy, and yet there's a quality of humility there when it comes right down to it. But he says he was so humble, and we could feel the Spirit to such an extent that we knew that what he was trying to tell us was true. See that? Now that's, that's the issue, see? Faith comes by hearing, and it's not just intellectualization. It comes by hearing through the testimony. You teach by testimony, and uh, this testimony, you just, you just know and you rely on the fact. You have to work at it. You have to plead for it. You have to wrestle for it. You literally have to wrestle for it and say, Lord, please help me get over my not headedism and help me have humility, and help me have the Spirit. And then the power comes, and it doesn't come from you, it comes from Him. You see that? And that Spirit, that teaching, then, is always attended by the Spirit of, of testimony and of revelation and of prophecy. Prophecy means testimony and witness of Christ, and of His Word, as well as the 
the portrayal of things. But that's the idea now. Now you teach them through the spirit of testimony and through the spirit of revelation. And when you do then, there is an enlightenment that comes. I have here, for example, a, a copy of a, of a statement from a good brother by the name of Daniel Tyler. He was a tow-headed kid, just uh, six, seven, eight years of age, up in the area of Pontiac, Michigan, back in 1835, when the prophet Joseph Smith went on a mission up in that area and uh, taught a lot of people and, and did some interesting things. And uh, was there at the Cairo home, which was just a humble log cabin. And in the course of that fireside they held there that evening, or meeting, the prophet talked about rebirth. And he makes several statements on that. He says, for example, uh, being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. Now, that's an interesting position that's... Uh, different than either the Catholic world or the Protestant world. The Catholic world rely on outward ordinances, and if you're in uh, the last rites and so forth, then, then that has efficacy in, in regard to salvation. And outward ordinances then become... And you'll find some person who's got convert Bible, and he can tell you exactly where, where something hit him. And some of that rebirth program among them, where there's stability and where there's true faith, is a genuine rebirth in a measure and a degree to see the kingdom of God, at least to see Christ. Uh, some, of, some of that has that. I've learned that uh, by uh, the studies that I've done. I've, I've been absorbed in Christian literature for the last 14 years, and I'm talking about every day, and reading sermons and, 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 and uh, writings and so forth of the great Christian minds, uh, from Luther on down and from Wycliffe on down. And uh, there's, there's something there, but it's in part only, rather than certainly in fullness. The being born comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances, but their emphasis is on the Spirit, and that's it. And if you've had that, then you're saved. Now, that's not the emphasis of Joseph Smith. The spirit of being born again comes by the Spirit of God. You have to be born from above to see the kingdom. It's the power of the Spirit that begins to open things. You have to plant the, the word, the seed, as Alma put it, and that seed has to be alive and, and begin to, to germinate, and it must be light, and that light is discernible, and that's the fruit of the Spirit, and that's being born to see. But being born again then comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. And then you have to go on to the rebirth of water and of the Spirit. You see that? The prophet says, for example, on another occasion. I'll get to this Dan Tyler thing in just a minute. He says, it's one thing to see the kingdom of God and another thing to enter into it. We must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God. And we must subscribe to the Articles of Adoption to enter into it. Now, what are the Articles of Adoption? What does the term or the expression mean? I have three adopted sons. We don't have any of our own. We think they're improvements on the stock. But I have three adopted sons. And I, I get a chuckle out of it when some sister comes up to me and says, well, Brother Annis, those three sons, they, they don't... Uh, they don't look like their brothers. I said, well, that's all right. You know, they, they've got different mothers, all three of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I didn't tell them they also had different fathers. <laughs> but they have different mothers. <laughs> but in each instance, and when we, when we got one of those little tigers, and we've had some real spiritual... Uh, some real spiritual confirmations and some rich spiritual things in regard to those, to getting those kids. The Lord just gave them to us. And, uh, but in each instance, after you've had them for a while, and you go through the adoptive process, you go down to the judges' chambers and you get on the, the witness stand there, and they bring the Bible and you get your hand on it and you raise your hand in the square. You saw him spell it's fair to tell the truth, etc., etc. 
And then he asks you the pertinent questions in regard to the adoption program. Do you, will you accept these children as though they were natural born to you, will you in respect to inheritance, etc., etc.? Et and when you get through then, he said, okay, now these children are yours legally by the eyes of the law as though they had been born to you. You see that? Now, those are the articles of adoption there. Now, Joseph said, we must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God, and we must subscribe to the articles of adoption to enter therein. Now, what are the articles of adoption? The articles of adoption are the official means and way by which you enter into a family and become a son or a daughter in the family into which you were not originally born. Now, those are the articles of adoption. Now, whose family were you trying to get into? In whose family is salvation found? And the answer is the family of Jesus Christ. You see that? And so we, we then are going through the articles of adoption because I wasn't born physically of Christ, uh, of Christ's family. I, I, didn't, I didn't get born that way. Neither did any of you. But as Isaiah says, when he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, his posterity, his children. And as Abinadi says in Mosiah 15, who shall be his seed? And those who are his seed then who accept him and receive the powers of his atonement, receive the forgiveness of sins, receive the transformations of the, the Spirit, and, and begin then to take upon themselves the character of Christ, different from their own character, different from their own nature, become new creatures in him. And that modification then reserve, reserves the elements of integrity and goodness that's there, but it builds it on into the stature of Christ where you grow up to the fullness of the stat measure of the stature of Christ, as Paul says in Ephesians. See? All right, the articles of adoption, then, what are they? Well, they're faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance toward God, repentance from all sin, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when you get do that, and you do it rightly, and just as baptism in water is an immersion, so also must baptism of the Spirit be an immersion. It's got to be the envelopment and the workings of the Spirit on all phases of your body and your soul and your mind, so that you are merged in that and changed and transformed. If it's just the mechanical laying on of hands, that's just the way you get it. It's like, for example, building a house and inviting the, the electrician to come up and wire up the pole outside and get some juice in. And then you go into the house, and instead of using the refrigerator, though you might have it all there, and the electric stove and all of that, you go back and, and live like the pioneers and get yourself some candles. And you never turn on the switches, and you never use anything. See? And a lot of us in this church are living like the pioneers. We're living with candles. We're not turning on the switches like we ought to. See? We don't know what modern life is about in Christ. See? Well, that's the issue. Now... Getting back to it, the prophet in the summer of 1835 went up to Pontiac Mission. And among other things, he held a meeting at the Tyler home. Uh, Daniel Tyler later, so impressed with what the prophet said, that in later years then he wrote the following. He says, during his short stay, he, that is Joseph Smith, preached at my father's residence in humble log cabin, he read the third chapter of John and explained much of it, making it so plain that a child could not help understanding it if he paid attention. I recollect the substance of his remarks on the third verse, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The birth here spoken of, the prophet said, was not the gift of the Holy Ghost, which was a promise which promised after baptism, but was a portion of the Spirit which attended the preaching of the gospel by the elders of the church. The people, when they heard that, taught by the power of the Holy Ghost, the people then wondered why they had not previously understood the plain declarations of Scripture, as explained by the elders as they had read them hundreds of times. Now, that's not true of us. We don't do it that much. But that, this was a Bible reading time. He said, when they read the Bible, it was a new book to them. This was being born again to see the kingdom of God. They were not in it, but could see it from the outside, which they could not do until the Spirit of the Lord took the veil from their eyes. 
It was a change of heart, but not of state. They were converted, but they were yet in their sins officially. Now, that needs to be qualified a little bit, because there is such thing as being justified by the Spirit prior to official baptism. He goes on and says, um, Although Cornelius had seen a holy angel, turn to the tenth chapter of Acts, and on the preaching of Peter the Holy Ghost was poured out upon him and his household, they were only born again to see the kingdom of God. Had they not been baptized afterwards, they would not have been saved. Explain the fifth verse of John, of John chapter 5, Jesus' statement to Nicodemus, the second one, to be born of water and the Spirit meant to be immersed in water for the remission of sins and receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost thereafter. This was given by the laying on of hands of one having authority given of God. Daniel Tyler then adds, I have given his exact language as near as I can recollect it after a lapse of over 50 years, nearly 60. He says, The joy that filled my juvenile heart no one can realize except those who have had a foretaste of heavenly things. It seemed as though the gates of heaven were opened and a living stream flowed directly to the holy man of God. It, was, it also filled the house where we were sitting. To this day, when I think of it, which is quite often, and always when we hear these scriptures referred to, a thrill of joy and of testimony permeates the inmost recesses of my soul. Now, there's a man who taught the gospel with some impact. You see that? Teach these things freely to your children. If you teach it in the right way, they'll remember it for 50 or 60 years. And that's the question, and that's the issue now, my brothers and sisters. Now, when a person then is born again, they become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. There's only one revelation in the church that was given to a woman, and that was to the prophet's wife, Emma. It has an interesting beginning, though. It says this, verse 1, Hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, while I speak unto you, Emma Smith, my daughter. For verily I say unto you, all those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. Now, that's the declaration. Turn over, for example, to section 34. A revelation given to a young man, 19 years of age, about by the name of Orson Pratt, who was so impressed with the prophet and uh, committed himself to such an extent that he acquired the popular title of the Apostle Paul of Mormonism, traveled more miles, preached more sermons, published more literature than probably any man in his day, and at this point then had been converted by his older brother, Harley P. Pratt, and immediately went to see the prophet Joseph Smith, and in the course of that visit the prophets inquired of the Lord and received a revelation in behalf of Orson Pratt. It begins this way. Now note the filial relationship here, the father-son relationship. My son, Orson, hearken and hear and behold what I, the Lord God, shall say unto you, even Jesus Christ, your Redeemer. Now let's stop there for a minute. What relation did Parnity have to Christ? A son. He was a son of Jesus Christ. Now, he could elder brother Jesus all his life, but that would be a lesser relationship than what he's now got. The elder brother thing is true, but whenever you find a person who only has that relationship with Christ, you can put it down that that person is trivial and limited and narrow and superficial in his knowledge of God. It's not inappropriate to call Christ our elder brother, but it is inappropriate to make that the central theme of your address relating to him. He's your God. He's your Lord. He's your Father. When we say brothers and sisters, we're not talking about pre-earth life. 
We're not talking about sons and daughters of Adam. We're talking about the children of Christ. We belong to the same family. He is your father and he is my father. And you are his daughter or son and I am his son, if I've done the thing right. And therefore we're brothers and sisters and we call each other that for that reason. And that puts Christ in the immediate role of father, does it not? That does that. Now, in verse section 39 of the Doctrine and Covenants, here's another meaningful one given to another early convert by the name of James Coral. Coville, rather, pardon. Begins this way, hearken and listen to the voice of him who is from all eternity to all eternity. The great I am, even Jesus Christ, the light and the life of the world, the light which shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. The same which came in the meridian of time unto mine own, and mine own received me not. Now note the next verse. But to as many as received me gave I power. Now it takes more than theology. Gave I power to become my sons. And even so will I give unto as many has received me power to become my sons. You see that? Or do you receive power from Christ? You need to be changed. There's a transformation. You've got to be born again. You've got to be changed from the carnal and fallen state. And that takes power. And that's the power of the Spirit. And with it then are infused the gifts of the Spirit and the attributes of the Spirit and above all, finally, that love of Christ, which is conveyed only by and through the Spirit. See? And then we become the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Now, the classic statement on this is in the Pearl of Great Price. I want to turn to that now, to Moses chapter 6, and let's spend a little time in detail on this uh, to get what the Lord originally gave to Adam, and then what Enoch, as one of the great gospel teachers of his time, who uh, knew the Lord personally and who taught this doctrine, this doctrine to build Zion. How do you build Zion? You teach this doctrine. And then on the basis of this doctrine will become his sons and daughters. And then you teach the temple doctrine, that you become fathers and mothers spiritually under Christ. And then you get the challenges of not just understanding the great message of the temple, and that's the greatest teaching program in, that I have ever been in experience with, is the temple. And you don't know what you're there, and what you're seeing there, and what you're participating in, until the Spirit begins to teach you. And so you've got to go over and over and over again. And you've got to go with your mind open. And you've got to go then with your heart open and with the spirit of inquiry. And you've got to then come back and study the scriptures. And then you've got to go again. And you'll find that the greatest truths that I know anything about are those truths that are in the temple. I just long and yearn for the day when I could be in the temple and have the Lord say, Oh, okay, Andrus, open up and tell him what I've told you. I can't do that. I work in the temple, have done for the last five years. And we spend a little time when we're working there at the Vail. You've got 10, 15 minutes or so in between Vail programs. And you sit around and you talk about gospel, and a lot of them kind of focus on me. And we say, hey, brother, what, what do we know about this? And so we spend time talking. But even with those brethren, I can't tell them about the temple. There's things... That the greatest doctrines of the kingdom are portrayed in the temple ceremony and in the temple robe. Really, I'm telling you the truth. And uh, you really don't know what you're doing there until you know those. And yet, for some reason, they're not uh, ours to talk about yet. We haven't built the foundation. We haven't paid the price. We haven't got where we ought to get as a people. And any time I would think about it, I can feel the check of the Spirit. Uh-uh. mm mm-hmm. Don't do it. But I've had the thing open personally, and it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. And there's beautiful things there. And I'm not trying to say that I'm any particular one. I know people 
I, I know people I associate when I go talk with them, I listen. I listen because I know what they have. And a lot of people I don't necessarily listen to except for courtesy reasons in order to help them, see. But sometimes I listen and I sit at the feet because there are people that the Lord is talking with in preparation to fulfill his purposes in this world. And he's working on an individual personal plane and you begin to find a few of them and you cherish that relationship but you can't do much more than just listen and say, hey, he's giving his Keep your eye on the living prophet. Get your home teaching done. Stay within the framework where you are. Don't go over there to Manti. Leave that junk along over there. Leave all that, see. Just get down and do your homework. And hold these other things like Mary of old, where she pondered in her heart the things that she had been told, see. Now, we're in a time of transition. We're getting ready. The Lord is getting ready, I'm sure, to bring about one of the greatest and probably the greatest era of his kingdom on this earth's history. And I'm talking about uh, things that will take place with many of you here and with your children. And it will have associated with it more phenomenal things and more challenges uh, than anything in this dispensation with the exception of those foundation things like the first vision and like the restoration of priesthood. Other than that, it will eclipse everything that the first, that the early day dispensation has. And we've got to get ready for it, my brothers and sisters. And the way you get ready for it is to understand the doctrine of the fall and the atonement and rebirth and work on the thing and plead with the Lord. Get down on your knees and say, Lord, help me get hold of my nutheadedism. And I'm not talking about just overcome the major sins. You ought to get that out of the way. I'm talking about these things that are displeasing to him, that are out of harmony with him, that we just kind of harbor and we live with and uh, we justify ourselves with because, you know, everyone's got their faults and all that kind of thing. You, the one thing you need to pray for, for the, in the greatest way, is for the Lord to reveal yourself to yourself. I've been working on that, and, and oh, it's an ugly picture. It's an ugly picture. It really is. To see me as he sees me. I, I could just vomit. I could. And when you, and then you, then, then you, you know, then you say, Lord, <laughs> hey, thanks. <laughs> now, now help me do something about it. See, now help me make this rebirth thing work. I, I need a new heart. I, I need to be a new person, see? I need to get rid of this impatience. I need to get rid of this ego. I need to get rid of, of, of this worldly interest. Not that you are not in the, do the things of the world and become a master in it, but I need to get things oriented. I need my head screwed on straight. I need to get my priorities straight, see? And I need to walk with you, and I need to feel the flow of the Spirit every day. And please help me to do that, see? That's what we need to do. Now, the greatest statement on that is here in, in Moses 6. And you raise your eyebrows on a few things on this, but let's go ahead. Beginning with verse 47, Enoch is talking to the people, and it says, And Enoch spake forth the words of God, the people trembled, and could not stand in his presence. Now, he taught this doctrine with the pure Adamic tongue. And that Adamic tongue then was so comprehensive in his capability to express ideas in detail and when you get the pure spirit of truth in that sense, and it impacts on the human soul, they buckled in their knees. You see that? They trembled in his presence because of the power and because he brought to focus the clear principles of truth with such clarity that it is impacted on every aspect of their minds and their souls. And they trembled then, could not stand in his presence. But it says, and he said unto them, because that Adam fell, we are. Now, that's what Le Lehi later built on, you see. And by his fall came death, and we are made partakers of misery and woe. Behold, Satan hath come among the children of men, and tempted them to worship him, and men have become carnal, sensual, and devilish, and are shut out from the presence of the Lord. And that's the state of the human family, see. And he goes on to say, But, our, but God hath made known unto our fathers that all men must repent. And he called upon our father Adam by his own voice and said, 
I am God. I made the world and men before they were in the flesh. And he also said unto him, If thou wilt turn unto me and hearken unto my voice and believe and repent of all my, thy transgressions and be baptized even in water in the name of mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, asking all things in his name, and whatsoever ye shall ask, it shall be given you. And note what the gift of the Holy Ghost is here for, and what it's given for. It's given so that you can ask all things in his name, and whatsoever you shall ask, it shall be given you. Now let that sink down into your hearts and let it be a, a, the greatest reality in your life next to your, your witness and testimony of Christ. That through him and the gift that he gives you called the gift of the Holy Ghost, you can, you've got the, the third member of the Godhead sitting right there beside you and you can ask anything. And that which you ask will be given depending on the kind of faith that you've got. And make him then the great teacher in your life. And get into the flow of the Spirit. And then handle that with the personal discipline to take that's required. And then come down into the depths of humility and see that, that Christ died of a broken heart. And in order to be one with him, you've got to have that broken heart. You've got to live on that plane. And that doesn't mean that you grovel and that you sob and bawl all day long. But that does mean that your heart is right. And that you walk in the strength and dignity and power and light and truth and glory of his spirit. That's what that means. You see that? All right. He goes on to say, And our father Adam spake unto the Lord and said, Why is it that men must repent and be baptized in water? Okay, now why? What, where, where does baptism fit? What is the idea of baptism? What is its significance to the whole cosmic picture? What's its significance to my life? Is it just something I do when I'm eight years of age? And is it just something I do to get into the church? What is baptism in meaning, in idea, in concept, and in its place then in this whole scheme of life? And this is the thing the Lord then begins to talk to him about. He said, And the Lord said unto Adam, Behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the Garden of Eden. Now, that's the power of the atonement. And when did it begin to operate? It began to operate as the fall got underway. And this on the basis of covenant. The covenant Christ made. Then the power of the atonement began to act. Otherwise, things would have gone through down and bumped on the bottom and disintegrated and there would have been no life. All right, I have forgiven thy transgression in the garden. Hence came the saying abroad among the people that the Son of God hath atoned for original guilt. And now note this is qualified. It's followed by a comma and then the word wherein. The Son of God hath atoned for original guilt, comma, wherein the sins of the parents cannot be answered upon the heads of the children, for they are whole from the foundation of the world. He didn't say, Adam, I've forgiven your transgression, therefore you can go back to the Garden of Eden tomorrow and be like you were before. He didn't say that. He says, I've forgiven your transgression now, wherein, wherein the sins of the parents cannot be answered upon the heads of their children, because they are whole. Now, there is a doctrine of original transgression. The sectarian world calls it original sin. But there is also the application of the atonement, so that children then are born free of legal consequence. And so we say in the second article of faith, we believe that men will be punished for their own transgressions. Don't we say that? For not for Adam's sin, but for their own transgressions. And that idea then comes out in, in the second article. And it's based on this particular, on this particular statement here. All right. Uh, and then the Lord turns around and he gives us a rather challenging one that, that I've seen a lot of eyebrows raised when he even mentioned it. He says, And the Lord spake unto Adam, saying, Inasmuch now as thy children are conceived in sin. Wow. I mean, that one turns on the spirit of opposition in about 99% of the Mormon's hearts. Doesn't it? 
Inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin. I've read that and people, <clears throat> and so I come back and I say, well, let's look at that. Who said it? And they say, the Lord. Are you challenging what the Lord said? <laughs> they got him, you know, you got him. And yet they still don't believe it. Then I say a qu second question. In the context, in context, what was the context of what he said? The context was the verse about, I have forgiven thee thy transgression and, and children are whole from the foundation of the world. That's what he's, that's the context, isn't it? That's the lead on, the lead in statement, isn't it? All right, now, and then I have to point out, you know, that, that there are a lot of true things that have been perverted. Just take the ordinance of baptism. You've got sprinkling, you've got pouring, you've got dry cleaning, and I don't know what else you've got, and they call it baptism. Don't they? They call it. Now, because they do that, do you repudiate baptism and, re and just throw it away and say you don't believe it? How do you handle the issue when someone thinks he's been baptized, when it's been in one of these other distorted manners and forms? How do you handle that? You don't throw baptism away. Now, how do you handle being conceived in sin? When you know that what they say is wrong, how do you handle that? Do you still have faith enough that the Lord knew what he was talking about? you do that? Well, sometimes we don't. You see, sometimes we don't. Let me read on now. Inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin, even so, when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts. And they taste the bitter that they may know to prize the good. Now, what, what happens? Are you conceived in sin? Some people misunderstand terms. They make conception and birth synonymous. The Lord didn't say that you're born in sin or born into a sinful world. He said you're conceived in sin. That's, as I understand it, about nine months difference. You're conceived in sin. Now, it's true that you're also born into a sinful world, and it's also true that you can say that, the, that uh, when someone breathes on you, not just breath-wise, but with his ideas and his views, it can contaminate you. You can get contaminated by the world. That's true, too. But you're also conceived in sin. Now, let me put it this way. Suppose you took just the finest, purest, cleanest girl and the finest purest, cleanest boy who were married, and at the time of marriage you, you put them in a special situation where you filtered the air, you fed them kosher foods, and you only let them see good videos, <clears throat> and you didn't have any kind of a contaminant uh, affect them at all. And they, uh, in their beautiful marriage relationship, uh, had a baby, and then you took that baby, uh, sterile clothes and pictures in the birth process, and uh, and then you fed it kosher foods, and you filtered the air and and cleaned up the water, and and uh, did all those things with that baby. Would that baby ever die? And the answer is yes. Why? Because it's conceived in sin. There are forces of sin, powers of sin, that are implanted in each new embryo at conception. You are conceived to die, not born to die. You are conceived to die. You see that? And those forces are forces of sin, and they're implanted there. Now, the power of the atonement steps in and acts. So that children are alive in Christ. They're whole from the foundation of the world. It doesn't negate all the effects of the fall. It negates the legal things. But the conception with the powers of the fall transmitted in conception, this ballgame, this program continues. You see that? 
And each of us has those elements within us. And then he goes on to say, even so when you begin to grow up and the physical body begins to mature and these, these baneful elements in this, this body that we call a corrupt body, scriptures repeatedly a corrupt body, as those elements then begin to act and my emotions begin to mature and I grow up and get through puberty and, and, uh, and the real uh, vinegar in the life of a man then begins to, to flow in my veins. And I begin then to, uh, to enter into adulthood and to have adult feelings. And then as I think about expressing those things, too often sin conceives in my heart. And there's a deflecting power within my life. And instead of that pure, virtuous emotion that develops being expressed so that it falls on a perfect trajectory, it moves off a little bit. And it moves off a little bit, see. And then too often, the next time it expresses, I don't try it even at the trajectory level. I try it where it moved off to last, and it goes off a little bit more and off a little bit more. You see that? And sin conceives in my heart, and I taste the bitter that I know, we know in Christ the good. Now this is what's called spiritual and moral agency. And the agency of the individual is built into his life, her life. Pardon? If we can get her back on the firing line, I'd like to spend just a little time completing this subject of rebirth. I've got a whole batch more stuff, but I think I can get that integrated in somewhere this afternoon. Now, what we've been discussing then is the Lord's revelation to Adam, and the preludes of it are the Enoch statement about we're in this fallen carnal state, and the whole idea then comes into what is the real meaning of baptism. And in order to understand that, it's necessary to understand how the atonement operates in, rely, in relation to children, the individual, uh, and then it's necessary to offer and understand the qualifications and what still remains. You're still in this fallen state. You're still here. And uh, the fallen state is perpetuated by conception, as well as by conduct. It's perpetuated by conception, as well as by conduct. The individual, properly understood, is conceived in sin. And that means that in the act of conception, these forces of original sin and transgression, these things that Adam brought that bring deterioration. These things are transmitted in conception and implanted in each new embryo. And then, as they begin to mature within you, then they begin to deflect the emotions and the feelings. They begin also to contract your feelings. One of the consequences of the fall is narrowness of mind. Narrowness of soul, narrowness of outlook on life. And then there are people who go clear on over and they get so broad and so liberal that uh, uh, their brains fall out. They don't have any rationale, see. But too often there's narrowness. There's narrowness in regards to, to ourselves, to our bodies, our bodily functions. There's narrowness in regards then to, to what God has given us, and there's contraction of soul. And we need then to get our lives centered in Christ in order to begin to have that overcome and set aside. Now this, though, gives us the agency. And so the Lord says in verse 6, 56, chapter 6 of Moses, And it is given unto them to know good from evil. Now, it's not talking about knowing good from evil from the standpoint of sight and an outward observation. Now, that is true also. But it's given, he's talking about this agency that's built into 
the physical system. There is a built-in system of agency through the fall. And this comes by being conceived in sin, in the true meaning of that term. So that sin then is implanted in the embryo, and then as the embryo develops, it begins to exercise its baneful influence, and it begins to deflect emotion and feeling. And in this way, he says, it's given to them to know good from evil, wherefore they are agents unto themselves. And then he goes on and says, and I have given you another law and commandment. And that brings us now to the need to be born again. Wherefore, teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent, or they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, for no unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence, for in the language of Adam manifoldness is his name, and the name of his only begotten is, uh, is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, the righteous judge. And then comes the statement, Therefore I give unto you a commandment to teach these things freely unto your children, saying, Now here's the doctrine of rebirth, that by reason of transgression cometh the fall, which fall bringeth death. We've talked about that. Death didn't come by transgression. Death came by the fall. The fall brought death. And then there's implanted in the embryo uh, the consequences of the forbidden fruit. And he says, The fall brought death. And inasmuch as you're born into this world by water and by blood and the Spirit, which I have made, and so become of dust a living soul, even so ye must be born again. As important as it is to be born to get a physical body, how important is that? Have you ever seen a person walk around on this earth who wasn't born? Now, you will never see a person in the celestial kingdom except where children are concerned. But you'll never see an adult person in the celestial kingdom walk around who, in the celestial kingdom who hasn't been born again. It just won't be. Because you've got to come into that relationship. And he said, even so, you must be born again. And it goes on then to say, uh, born of water and of the blood. He says, you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water, and of the Spirit, and be cleansed by blood, even the blood of mine only begotten Son. And then the reason for that is given, that you may be sanctified from all sin. Now, this is the way sanctification comes, that you may be sanctified from all sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world. Now, the words of eternal life are not the printed words. You can read those without being born again. But you can't enjoy the words of eternal life, the true words, the living word of eternal life, unless the Lord writes it on their heart. The true epistle of Christ is not the written epistle. The true epistle is that which God writes on the hearts and the souls. And that person then becomes an epistle of Jesus Christ, a living, walking, moving, breathing epistle of Christ. See? And he enjoys the words of eternal life in this life and eternal life in the world to come. And then he says, For by the water ye keep the commandments. And I think that's self-explanatory. That's how you go about doing it. You get baptized and you've kept the commandments. By the Spirit you're justified. By the blood, you're sanctified. I remember when I uh, read this thing seriously years and years ago, and I hit that verse, my first response was, hey, there's something wrong. I mean, it's got the thing backwards. You're not justified by the Spirit. And you're not sanctified by the blood. You're justified by the blood. That paid the debt. So you're justified by the blood. And then the renovating sanctifying power is that of the Spirit, so you're sanctified by the Spirit. 
I says, you know, somehow this, the typist got a hold of this wrongly. The printer, he didn't do his job like he ought to have done. And then I began to ponder it over and say, Lord, now, what about this? And when I got a little insight from the right source, I found out that while that other view is true, so also is this one. And it depends on the way you're looking at it. Now, there are ways by which you are justified by the Spirit. And uh, in the study I've done in the last 14 years on the origins of liberty, that, that whole idea has become to mean very much to me. Because liberty wasn't born of the Greeks and of the Romans. Liberty was born of people who centered their lives in Christ. And the spirit of Christ is a spirit of liberty. And these people, while they lived in a day prior to the restoration of the gospel, these people got enough of the spirit of the Lord in their lives so that they got the spirit of liberty. And they got the spirit of free and open union. And they took power and authority from the archbishop and from the established order of the bishops of the English church. And they put power in the congregation on the premise that the congregation of people who had been born again, they had only been born to see, and I think they knew it, because they knew that they didn't have the full New Testament program. But they had born to, been born to see Christ, and they knew that they stood before him pure and clean. And they knew that they had his Holy Spirit to be and abide in their hearts. And they knew they had the light of his Spirit. So when they read the word, it was real. There was an illumination of mind. And they knew then that they had an indwelling relationship with Christ to a degree. They organized what you call an interim church, many of them. The interim church was called such on this premise that they knew the New Testament church had been lost, didn't exist anymore, and that it had spiritual powers and endowments that, that, uh, that hadn't been transmitted and certainly wasn't in traditional Christianity. But they knew that they had been enlightened by coming to God and enlightened by the Spirit and been born from above to see, the, to see Christ and to see his kingdom and to see that it wasn't on earth. And they knew that they, by the study of biblical prophecy, and they studied uh, the angel flying through the midst of heaven, they studied in the days that each king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. They knew that. They knew that there was a future dispensation. And they were in a dilemma where they didn't have anything but the word written word, and then the word that they could have written on their hearts by faith. And so they organized an interim church. The interim church wasn't visible. It had no external organization. The interim church was made up of people who had been born to see Christ and who were enjoying his spirit. They didn't have a right to baptize anyone, and they knew that. But they did have the right to meet together and to bear testimony and to read and study together. And they did have the right to know that Christ is a just God. And so they organized the church on that premise. You see that? And they organized the church on the basis that the Spirit of the Lord in the lives of each of them brought a natural union between them. And instead of them being subordinate to the archbishop and the bishops of the English church, Instead of doing that, then, they, they, they gathered together as a congregation, and they made their decisions as a congregation by the light of the Spirit in the congregation, and they took power from up there and they put it in the people. And then they got to thinking politically and says, now that same system ought to operate in, the, in, the, in political life. And so they then organized, or sought to organize, a political program based then on that great statement, although they didn't know it then, of Lincoln, of the people, by the people, and for the people. And they knew that the spirit of Christ was the spirit of liberty, 
and they knew that they were sons and daughters of God, and that they had rights because they were such. And these rights were unalienable. And they knew that their society ought to be based on covenant, mutual covenant with each other in Christ. And so they laid the groundwork for the birth of liberty, and they had enough of that so that they actually did that, and that's where America came from. That's really where America came from. Now, when it comes then to being justified by the Spirit, there is a true doctrine. There's a true doctrine of being justified by the Spirit. Let me ask you the question. When you come to the ordinance of baptism, and now think technically with me on this, do you receive, technically speaking, a remission of sins before baptism, in baptism, or after baptism? Technically speaking now, when do you receive a remission of sins? And the answer is the first, before baptism. Let me read it to you. Section 20 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 37. <clears throat> All those who humble themselves, speaking of the prerequisites of baptism, before God and desire to be baptized, and come forth with broken hearts and contrite spirits, and witness before the church that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end. Now note the next statement. Truly manifesting by their works that they have received the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of sins, of their sins. Those who meet those prerequisites shall be received by baptism into his church. Now, when do you get a remission of sins? Before, during, or after baptism? And the answer is before. When you've received the Spirit of Christ unto the remission of their sins. There's an interesting story in relation to this verse. Oliver Cowdy was the second elder, and actually he was an associate president of the church and of this dispensation. Hiram Smith was later given that appointment by rights, by privilege, and by his intimate association with the Joseph Smith. And so Hiram Smith then stands as a joint head of this dispensation with his brother Joseph. And according to Joseph Fielding Smith, and I've heard him say it personally, and he said it before President Grant, and it was confirmed by President Grant, that had Oliver Cowdery remained faithful, he and not Hiram would have died in Cottage Jail in order to have a dual testimony of this dispensation. But that right went to Hiram, went to Hiram by virtue of who he was, by virtue of his integrity, by virtue of the fact that he stood next to Joseph, by virtue of his integrity, and by virtue of the fact that he loved Joseph unto death. So. That right went to him. But Oliver Cowdery, to get back to the story, wrote Joseph Smith a letter and really blasted him. And he was writing about verse 37 of section 20. And he says, I command you in the name of God to take that verse out of that scripture. He didn't think, for example, that you had a remission of sins before baptism. <laughs> and what did Joseph do? He says, Oliver, get your head screwed on straight. That's what the Lord said. That's what he meant. Now, what I'm saying is this, that these people that gave us liberty, while they couldn't be born of water into the Spirit to enter the kingdom, they could be born of God, born from above to see the kingdom. And what they saw is that it didn't exist. And what they did was to organize an interim church, as I've explained. And what they looked forward was to the restoration of the gospel. And then what they did practically was to preach Christ, him crucified, the need to be born to see, the need to, to receive the living word and to plant it in your hearts and have it written on your hearts and your souls, and that that really is the gospel. It's not a letter, it's a spirit. 
Now, they taught that doctrine, and some of the statements they make are the most beautiful that I have ever read. I spent last April, the month of April, studying in the Vatican Library over in Rome. And probably the choicest thing that I found over there was a statement by a monk by the name of Savonarola. Lived in the 1480s and 90s. And that man just committed himself totally to Christ. Totally to Christ. And when he spoke to the people, they just literally buckled in the knees because of the power that he had. He finally took on the Pope in an effort to get the church reformed and ended up being burned at the stake. But some of the things that he wrote are classic, literally classic. I'm going to put them in this book. In fact, it just reoriented the whole approach I made, so I had to spend my time rewriting this volume one. But it was a beautiful experience, scene. And uh, I'm telling you, I walked out of that library just with tears in my mind. Thanks, Lord, thanks for what you've given me. This is worth coming to Rome for. I had to go through the procedure to get there. You could either go through the cardinals or the priest, and that was too narrow, and so the next way was to go through the mafia. Uh, and, but we got there, and we got into the library, <laughs> and we got a free place to live. And I lived with the monks in an abbey outside of Rome for a while, and we'd go down, and, and, and it, we got the schedule when they were eat, and we'd go down and watch them do their little crosses and all that kind of Very sincere. In fact, the guy who was head of it, who met him, said he's going to be their next pope. And he was really, really a man of quality and of character. We'd uh, listen to them go through their preliminaries, and then they had a big room about this big, and there was tables all around the edge of it, and, and we'd go up on that table and sit, and, and we didn't know, we didn't know, well, the brother I was with knew enough to get along with him, <laughs> the, the language, Brother <laughs> Bradford, Stuart Bradford, and, and uh, they'd serve us uh, three or four or five course meal, and, and we'd sit there and talk as much as we could with him, and, and uh, go up on that table and sit, and, and we, didn't, we didn't know, well, the brother I was with knew enough to get along with <laughs> the, the language, <laughs> Brother Bradford, Stuart Bradford, and, and uh, they'd serve us uh, three or four or five course meal, and, and we'd sit there and talk as much as we could with him and, and uh, enjoy that, and, and then we'd take off and get over to the Vatican Library, and I walked into that, and I don't know. I don't know quite how I got there. See, I, I've been with Stuart over to England before, the year before, at Oxford and at Cambridge and at the British Museum, and spent some time living over there. I had a friend who bought a manor house. It was built in 1420. It was an old house when Columbus left, and he refurbished it and, and said, anytime you're over here, you've got a place to live. So. And I found Brother Bradford was going over and says, hey, I'll get you a place to live and you get me a couple of tickets over there. And he had a friend who was an airline pilot from way, way back and had priorities. And so he got us some tickets and, and we ended up in England and, and we spent our time then in Oxford and in, and in uh, Cambridge libraries and there at the British Museum. And got a lot of really good things, enjoyed that. But, and he said, I've got to go on next year and, and get over to Rome. So. He had a very powerful friend down here in California who's a legal man and who does legal work for, for the big ones when the Shah of Iran had some real multi-billion problems, turned the whole thing over to him. And so he's got a lot of people owing him debts. And he said, well, the only way you can get in to the Vatican Library is, is through the, the, the cardinals and the priests, and that's, that's a little difficult. He says, but I can get you in through the mafia. So Stewart said, well, get us in, get me in. In the meantime, he's reporting to me, and finally he gets clearance, and about that time, I took it seriously and asked the Lord whether I ought to go. <laughs> he came to me and said, hey, I've got one. I'm leaving, leaving next week. <laughs> and so I said, well, Lord, what about that? <laughs> and he says, go. <laughs> and so I said, well, can you, can you get me in? <laughs> And so he says, give me a dime. And so he called. And so hey, next thing you know, we're, we're standing there over in Rome, and the airport, and 
big limousine drives up and <laughs> black limousine <laughs> and takes us to the Abbey and <laughs> we get all introduced and all set up there. Uh, well, that's to make a long story short. I get there into the Vatican Library, that beautiful building with all those things there. And, and I says, Lord, what am I here for? <laughs> what's, what's going on? <laughs> and, uh, and so I get into the card catalog and begin to look. And wow, I guess I find it's just a lot of real good stuff. And I started copying and writing that stuff, and I wrote so hard that I got a big old welt on my finger. Uh, writing every hour of the day, and I finally finished up. 15 minutes before the library closed the last day we were to be there. <laughs> and I walked out of that building and just, wow, wow, thanks, Lord, thanks. <laughs> so it's a beautiful thing. But this Savola Rola taught this doctrine of rebirth uh, from above and the powers of the Spirit uh, like I have never seen it expressed in any person this side of him, including the great personalities of the church. He had it. He just literally had it. And I just, I could hardly write for the tears. Just uh, just copy that stuff down. But what I'm saying now is that you receive the remission of sin. Uh, You receive the Spirit of Christ under the remission of sins. Now, otherwise, God ceases to be a just God. Otherwise, he ceases to be a just God. If a person comes to him, even in the Middle Ages, where there is no church, and they come to him in faith, and they believe and they commit their lives to him, do the demands of justice still have to be bombarded? Do they have to still be pummeled by the demands of justice? Or is the mercy of God sufficient to lift that demand and to at least give them the light of the Spirit to the extent they can receive it, see? Now, that's the issue, see? Now, you're justified by the Spirit. Now, there's four or five ways by which you're justified. The Spirit reaches down and drags you up out of the gutter at times. It pleads with you. It strives with you. And then when you're baptized, when you're baptized, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, as a person, ratifies the ordinance. And when he ratifies the ordinance, he puts into operation the blessing that pertains to it. And so one of the Holy Ghost's names is the Holy Spirit of promise, because in ratifying the ordinance, he puts into operation the promise and thereby is called himself, the ratifier, the Holy Spirit of promise. You see that? But that ordinance is a dead ordinance until he ratifies it, and so you're justified by the Spirit, see? And then it's only when we've lived in tune with the Spirit and, and it flecks out the elements of carnality, and they, they get flecked out at times as you serve in the, in the ways of the Lord, and the Spirit comes down this way and on through that way, see? And as it passes through you to those to whom you teach and those to whom you minister, it flecks out the corruption, and it does it gradually and gradually until there's a clean situation, see. And uh, as it does that and you finally stand before the Lord on the great and final judgment day and he says you're pure, you're clean, and you're now fully justified. This has been by the action of the Spirit. And so, like the Lord said here in his explanation to to, uh, Adam, You are justified by the Spirit, and you are sanctified by the blood. Now, the blood is the operative power by which the Spirit works, and this is the blood of Gethsemane. It's the blood of the broken heart of Christ. It's the blood that he shed when he descended below all things. It's the blood when he put his whole self in all his divine majesty and glory and power on the altar, and died a spiritual death, and began to disintegrate spiritually and physically, so the blood came out of every core of his body. That is the blood of remission. That is the blood also 
of sanctification scene. And then the Lord goes on and tells us what happens. And here's, this is probably one of the greatest statements in Scripture, verse 61 and 62. Now, he's talking about rebirth, and he's not talking about just believing in, in some gospel teachings. He's talking about the transformation of rebirth. And he says, therefore, it's given to abide in you the record of heaven. Now, what is the record of heaven? It's the celestial computer. Whenever God speaks, that word is recorded in the record of heaven. That's part of his divine nature. It's not something over here aside from him. It's in him. Whenever he acts, it's recorded in the record of heaven. Whenever the Spirit emanates from his person and his presence, fills the immensity of space, and reveals back to him that which goes on, it's put in the record of heaven, and it's put there in all of its glowing color and feeling and emotion and light and power, so that it's a living thing. Now, when you tap into the record of heaven, you tap into the event as though it were just happening. I know that that is true by personal experience. I know that that is true. And it's a beautiful thing. The record of heaven can be implanted in your life, and you have access to it as much as if you push the right keys and turn on the, the power of your computer and do the right keys and bring the picture up, it brings it up. And the record of heaven is the celestial computer, and it's on this basis that you become a god, and it's on this basis that you can tap into the past, and the present, and the future. And it's centered in you, and it's revelatory. It's revelatory, not just in ideas. It can be revelatory in all the power and the color of the experience. So that you're there as though you were actually in the scene and on the site of the scene. It's there. Now, it's given by rebirth to abide in you the record of heaven. Now, that's a little more than just learning the outward order, see? And then there's a semicolon there, which means that it's rather a distinct break, and it goes on and talks about something else that's given to abide in you. Only the record of heaven, but the comforter, that's given to abide in you. Now, we want to know a little more about the comforter. The Holy Ghost, then, as a comforter. His power, then, his living power, and even, if necessary, his person can dwell in you, as an evil spirit might dwell in a person, the Holy Ghost, because he has a body of spirit, can dwell there. And, the, and is given to abide in you, the record of heaven and the comforter, the peaceable things of immortal glory. Now, what are these peaceable things of immortal glory? Well, those are what Paul calls in the book of Galatians the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are things that are produced by the Spirit. And their patience, their love, they're that kind of love particularly that you call charity. And it's by being born again that the, not only the record of heaven and the comforter, but the peaceable things of immortal glory begin to abide in you. It's a beginning. It's, you are an embryo of God. But a God isn't just a perfected being in the sense of his conduct or in the sense of his physical resurrected body. A God is a being who has the divine nature, who has the glory, the power, the brilliance, the intelligence, the light, the truth, and the life of all those in him. And for you then to become such, you've got to be born again, and that's the beginning of your godhood. And it's on that basis you become sons and daughters of God, see? And so the peaceable things of immortal glory began to dwell within you. And that which, uh, that, uh, the truth of all things, and that again is the Spirit, as it emanates from God's presence and fills the immensity of space and reveals back, it's the truth of all things. And it centers in us. And if you use it, the big sin of the Latter-day Saints is that we don't use what we've got. We're just going on mundanely. 
and doing the external orders and paying our tithing and doing our own righteousness rather than the righteousness of God. I want to say a little about that a little later if we can. All right, that uh, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things. Read section 88, where the Spirit emanates from God's presence, and it fills the immense space, and it quickens and it gives life to all things. And that begins to dwell within us by rebirth. And which maketh alive all things, and that which knoweth all things, and hath all power according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. And there's a qualification to the exercise of God's power in that sense. It's qualified in its expression by those statements, by wisdom, mercy, truth, and justice. Because one of the basic ideas of life is that expressed in section 90, that all truth is independent in the sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself and not to be acted upon. Otherwise, there is no existence. God doesn't come down with arbitrary power. He may come down in judgment when it's necessary, but not with arbitrary power. He works with rather than over people. And his power is qualified in its use and expression by wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. You see that? And then know what he says in verse 62. And now behold, I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men through the blood of mine only begotten, who shall come in the meridian of time. Now what, my brothers and sisters, is the plan of salvation? It's this doctrine of rebirth, isn't it? And what happens with rebirth? When you've been born of water and blood and the Spirit which the Lord makes, and so become a dust of living soul, then you're born again of water and blood and the Spirit into God's kingdom. And on that basis, you're justified by the Spirit, and you're sanctified by the blood, and then you have dwell in you the record of heaven, the comforter, the peaceful things of immortal glory, the truth of all things, that which quickeneth all things, that which hath all power. You have those things begin to dwell, and what effect do they have within us? This is where it makes you a new creature. This is where the destiny of Christianity is not just to unfold your natural self according to the gifts and talents that you have as a natural person. It's actually to make you a new person to become a different kind of person than you, than you even can dream you could be. And eventually to grow up to the fullness of Christ, just like the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians. And this is the plan of salvation. And then here in, in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, It came to pass that Enid continued his speaking, Behold, our father Adam taught these things, and many have believed and become the sons of God, and many have believed not and have perished in their sins. Now, on this doctrine, this is the hinge on which either salvation or damnation comes. Is that right? How often should we teach this? Now, Adam set the example. He goes on to say, for example, that, that he, in verse 64, it came to pass when the Lord had spoken of Adam, that our father Adam cried unto the Lord, and he was caught away by the Spirit, and was carried down into the water, and was laid under the water, and was brought forth out of the water. And thus he was baptized, and the Spirit of God descended upon him, and thus he was born of the Spirit, and became quickened in the inner man. See, that's a little more than theology. Quickened in the inner man. And he heard a voice out of heaven saying, Thou art baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And he got more than we get, if I can just say that in passing. Thou art been baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost. This is the record of the Father and the Son from henceforth and forever. Thou art after the order. Now, this is the life order. This is not necessarily the priesthood order, although you can apply this to priesthood. But basically, it's speaking of the life order. Thou art after the order of him who was without beginning of days or end of life. You, you now have, have become a son. See, the issue, the issue is concerned with conception and with the transmission of attributes and powers. A father transmits attributes and powers to his children. And if they don't get those attributes and powers, they're not his children. That's just, just that simple. And if you don't get attributes and powers from Christ, 
then you're, then, then you're not his son or daughter. But when you do get them, then you're after his order, his order of life, this order that leads to eternal life. You're after the order, then, that's without beginning of days or end of life, from all eternity to all eternity. Behold, thou art one in me, a son of God, and thus may all become my sons. Can you see that picture? I, I want to come back to a little of this this afternoon, if I can, but I think we better move on to something else. We're only an hour late, President. <laughs> Have patience. <laughs>